This is the Discuss Metal Podcast with Stephen Sorrow of Unteachers. Hosted by Dan Terry, presented by DiscussMetal.com. You could swap Anthrax out for Sepultura any day to be fine. Oh, was, I see. You've, re, you've re-edited the four. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, oh, I totally have, yeah. Completely. What is what is the big four for you? I mean, Sepultura is definitely on my big four. Metallica, Slayer. It's Metallica, Slayer, Testament, and Sepultura is my big four. Testament? Really? Yeah, I love Testament. Do you, you know my bass player, Jim, from Tantrum, is playing music with the Testament guys right now, right? Did not know that. He's the singer of Vengeance now, and he's also playing with somebody from Testament. I'm trying to remember who. Is the Vengeance ever going to do anything? I just talked to Jim today. He said the album's done. Okay. Well, I'll have to. I'll have he said to they're call, making shirts. I'll have to call him up to do a discuss metal. You should have him on, and you should. You know what we need to do though? Someday, maybe when the Tantrum reissue starts to surface, we should have all three from Tantrum of the Muse on the show at once. That'd be cool. Because it would. It would be the first time since probably 2004 that all three of us will be communicating at the same time with each other, which would be really funny. Well, what's funny is I never got to see Tantrum play live. And there was one time it was a cornerstone. It was either 2000, might've been 2004. It was either 2003, 2004, 2005. I can't remember those cornerstones all blend together for me, but I remember I was super stoked to see Tantrum and I didn't get the message that they weren't playing, that you guys weren't playing. Uh, be, for some reason, I don't remember what it was, but then Alathian just played instead, which I was okay with. Yeah, but I was like kind of pissed off because I'd because ar- I'd already seen Alathian play two times that week, and I was like, "All right, guys, you guys want to see some crazy stuff?" You know, like these guys tantrum. I heard they like set people on fire and stuff, and <laughs> you know, like you know, they, they you know they punch each other in the face while they're playing. Like there were all kinds of weird rumors about tantrum. And uh, I, I really hope that tonight's chat, we kind of get into some of that. And, some of them uh, were true. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, in case you guys didn't know who were just tuning in, I am talking to Steven Sarrow of Tantrum of the Muse, Unteachers. And uh, the, his newest project is actually very, very creatively named. It is just called Steven Sarrow. Steven Mark Sarrow. Steven Gotta Mark Sarrow. My bad. I, I <laughs> You know, that's why we do interviews, because we don't know things, and we have to actually ask the people involved. You know, I, I should know better, but uh, I don't. Uh, and, you know, you, you, you've heard Steven on a billion episodes of discography discussion. and uh, One billion. Hopefully a billion more. You know, we'll just keep it going. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, yep. uh, we I've got Steven. He's, he's laid up. Uh, basically, he... Hurt yeah, himself. I'm a, I'm a hot mess. <laughs> You're gonna. Yeah. You'll probably hear it in the microphone. Yeah, he hurt it. He hurt himself uh, at work, and uh, he's trapped. He can't get away. So I was like, "Well, this is the perfect time to move in." Yep. So, uh, yeah, we're getting. Uh, I'm we're getting the here. unfiltered uh, Stephen Sorrow tonight. Unfiltered, sober, actually semi sober. Just pain medication. Not uh, not no alcohol tonight. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll work on the other half for you. There you go. As as good as I can. But uh yeah, so one of the one of the things that I like about your career in music is the feeling of spontaneity, the feeling of not really knowing what I'm going to get next. Cuz like dude, we talk all the time, but like I am never like when you're like, "Hey, check this out." I'm never prepared. <laughs> uh for 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 what it is <laughs> or what it's going to be. And um you know, I guess I guess the best way to to really get into all that is just to kind of start at the beginning. Um, you know, just uh, give us a little bit of uh, information as far as like what got you into music. What what made you what made you go from being a guy that just likes music, like like somebody like me who's an official appreciator of music but not really a contributor. You know what what is it that you know what, what is it that you loved about music growing up, and what what is it that made you want to become a creator? Striper. I mean, that's, that's it right there. I 1985 in my bedroom playing with my toys and my mom called me downstairs and showed me Striper on, uh, on, I want to say the double words or some kind of award show. Huh. And they were playing, <clears throat> they were playing, um, makes me want to sing during, uh, um, soldiers under command. And, um, they were in their full glory of stripes and, 
makeup and everything. And then, and all and the stage was co- covered in stripes. The drums had stri- Everything was just like a spectacle. I had never seen anything like that. Cause I didn't grow up on kiss and all that stuff. So I, the spectacle of, of those types of bands was a striper for me. So it was like seeing aliens. It was like seeing like, <laughs> it was literally like seeing like something from another planet. So obviously, and just sort of the, the, the big hooks and the big sound of it just blew my mind, literally blew my mind. So I was, you know, I got the tapes and I used to, I got into drums because of Robert Sweet and I used to play drums a lot as a kid. That was my first instrument. It was the only instrument I learned like to read the music. Um, and I, I took the masking tape. My dad got me a, like a real little red starter drum set. It was like candy apple red. And I, I took white masking tape and I put stripes on the covered all the drums with tape to make stripes. And I used to do put the, the Robert sweet, uh, silver cross makeup on my cheek. Like he used to, oh, I was obsessed and I would play all their cassettes in the headphones. I'd play along. I learned how to hold time, <clears throat> hold a beat to striper albums. And then, um, from there it would, uh, you know, I never really, I, I wanted to be a, a rock star in the way they were rock stars. And then, um, and I had just started absorbing a lot of Christian music, um, Petra and Whiteheart and stuff like that. But, um, the ones that really just sort of made me dream and think of big things was Striper. And then, um, the, the extreme music came after that. So, um, uh, the, the one that did that same sort of blow my mind effect would have been, uh, human sacrifice by vengeance, which I probably already told that story on the vengeance episode I was on with you guys, <clears throat> but hearing human sacrifice for the first time just put me in another state of mind of what music can do to people's souls. And, um, you know, and as you get older, you get into more different stuff, punk and hardcore and tooth and nail records came along and just the, it developed from there. But, <clears throat> but as, as, as far as the first, thing that made me want to do music and create music was, was it started with striper 1985. No joke. So just yellow and black just kind of invaded your mind. Yeah, man. I was, I was so obsessed because when I saw, I was too young to see striper in concert. Um, they played here in PA a few times during the arena days and I, my parents would never take me. So I never got to see them in the, peak glory days of striper and um so when we were doing tantrum of the muse in 99 um there was the first ever striper expo um in new jersey i think it was and um we we in tantrum got we had a really crusty tour van we drove to jersey in that thing and slept in that van overnight and got out and just got in line and went into the striper expo and I had the four guys from Striper uh, sign my my very first Soldiers Under Command CD, which I really wish was my record now. But uh, sure, because I could frame that thing. But um, and you can frame uh, the CD. It was really exciting because, and this is a true story. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to rewind just a little bit because I got a little ahead of myself. Go ahead. So so we we found a um a Striper piano book for like the piano music to play honestly. And, um, my sister Desiree, uh, was played piano music at the time. So we were like, well, why don't we get Desiree to play the piano music and then we'll do the, you know, the bass guitar drums. And then we were like, that'd be great. We'll cover striper. Um, no one will see it coming cause it's tantrum of the muse, you know? And, um, but then I was like, I'm going to reach out to Michael sweet. I want to see if he'll do the vocals for it, but let us play the music. This is at the time when Michael sweet was not in striper anymore. Right. And he was, he was living in Massachusetts. I think it was, and, um, was more involved with his family and church and stuff. And he wasn't really big on the, you know, the stage stuff anymore. So it was a little easier to reach and a little more, um, down the earth. And it wasn't, it wasn't like in the, the, crazy world of striper it wasn't the glory days yeah 
Right, right. So, um, in fact, I think he was a park ranger or something at the time. Can you imagine that? You're like trying to put out a fire and Michael Sweet walks up to you and is like, hey, you guys need to put that fire out completely, okay? He's like, no, he's like, gotta be strong. Keep <laughs> the fire burning. Right. No, um, he had an email. So, I just emailed him and told him who we were. Um, and uh, he never heard of us, obviously. But um, a buddy of mine lived in the same town as him who had moved from Lancaster to, to that town. And he was going to his youth group. So he started talking to him about tantrum of the muse. Cause it, cause um, Michael sweet, I guess was involved in a youth group. So he heard the name. Then we emailed him. And I think at that, it was sort of that sort of all at the same time. So he, he was aware who we were. And um, we asked him, I asked him, I should say about singing on the, the cover and I hit send and I just laughed to myself. I said, <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah. And then within, within 20 minutes, I got a response and I opened it oh, wow. and he says to me in this email, he said, sounds like interesting idea. Send me some demos. And then like, I got freaked out because it was like, oh, I'm, no. getting too, I'm getting <laughs> too close that this is, could actually happen. Right. So then I just panicked and just didn't even follow up on it. Oh no. And, and so Going back to the Striper Expo, which would have been, uh, I don't know, probably within eh, months, maybe yeah. a year, maybe a year. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm in line. I'm meeting them. And I gave him a copy of The Hardest of Two-Headed Sperm on CD. And he looks down. He sees the name of the band. He looks back up at me, and he's straight up in the middle of this expo, meeting literally hundreds of people, <laughs> fans. He looks at me, and he goes, Dude, you never sent me the demo. <laughs> you got called out. I could not believe it, man. I was just like, it was, that's all I needed. That's all I needed, man. Right there. Yeah. And I was just like, it just felt so good. And then this is the first time they've been in a room together as Striper since they broke up, since like the glory days. And they, they came together that night like kind of unrehearsed and played a concert for the expo. And so, you know, I'm all, I'm like high as a kite because of that experience. And then I go in to watch them play and, um, they kick into rock the people from against the law and Michael sweet just hits the first note. And I'm not joking, man. I cried like a girl. True story. I just broke down. I couldn't believe I was seeing Striper finally after all those years. I was just like, my, just tears were rolling down my face. I was so excited. I was singing every word. And like me and Rick and Jim and like some of our friends, we were all like grabbing each other by the throats and just shaking each other like out of excitement, going crazy. It was such a great, great experience. So yeah, my my musical life was shaped by hearing them. And, you know, to go, to be in a band at the time and to get to you know, full circle, come around to that was, was really one of my favorite memories. So, yeah. No, that's awesome. I mean, it, it's, it's always fun to meet your heroes, you know? It is. And like, nice. <laughs> like for me, you know, and you're going to laugh at me, but like, you know, the first time I met Zayo, it was very much kind of the same, kind of the same deal for me because I was I was always such a mega fan. And granted they they were never on the same level as like Striper or, you know, a band that that, that right. actually had mainstream success. I don't know if a band like Zayo could ever have you know mainstream success, but um it's really cool just to have that connection and 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 just to know that like people, you know, the people that are in these bands are just people. You know, they're not um you know like he remembered that. Like straight up like you know, that's, that, that's incredible when you think of a guy that has so much going on, you know, especially, especially in 2019, you know, I mean, granted that's not when you met him, but you know what I'm saying? Like all those years later, he's just like, or no, it was yeah. months later, actually, I guess is what you're saying. But like, just the fact that he remembered yeah, it was, that. Yeah, it was like, you know, within a really, year or something like that. Yeah, really cool. Still, because you got to think he, oh my. he probably had like tons of messages from people and emails and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he was I'm sure he was still getting fan mail and still being treated like the star that he pretty much still was, you know, just 
it was just a dry spell, I guess, because they weren't active. Right. But then they, you know, the, but then they got back together shortly after that, and then they've had a whole other like resurgence. I would say a longer career since the glory days. I would say, still yeah, stuff. because I mean, in, in my experience, it's of twenty doing, years. Yeah, in my experience of doing a metal podcast, I mean, anytime somebody mentions Striper, there's a little bit of like reverence, you know, like oh yeah. Like they were, they were a great band, and they still kind of are, you know. Like, yeah, um, I mean, it it always sickens me when people who came up on the same era of music, the the LA metal scene or whatever, um, just love to hate on Striper. And I always say, look, put the Christian lyrics aside and just look at it. It's undeniable that they were the best. I mean, yeah, and like honestly, I I think that Striper was one of the first bands, honestly, in that genre that was able to present the Christian message and it not be some like weird embarrassment. thing. Yeah, yeah, like it was like, dude, we're we're just as good as all of our contemporaries. Yeah, and to and to think that how many were also doing that it was like nobody really. Yeah, I mean, and there was, were eventually some. Um, in different genres, maybe that crossed over, but not not in that genre. Yeah, you know, you had and like Michael cool. W. Smith and Amy Grant, you know, that were playing arenas and stuff, but but not. But Striper was playing arenas with metal bands with with secular people. Yeah, yeah. secular uh, culture and all that. Yeah. So you know, moving moving a little bit forward, you know, from you know, obviously the infatuation with Striper, which I think, <laughs> which I think, I mean, honestly, like <laughs> hey, a lot of us. <laughs> well, yeah, but like, I mean, a lot of us, you know, that grew up on Christian music, you know, like Striper is kind of the, the, the alpha of, uh, of that time where they were the first band that you could listen to and not feel like weird or stupid for listening to. Um, and you were talking a little oh, bit I've about. I've gotten beaten up a lot in school for it by the Guns N' Roses kids. I, I never did, <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, but I mean, look at Guns N' Roses now. I mean, they're a joke, <laughs> yeah. but that's just my yeah. opinion, my correct opinion. But, uh. The correct opinion. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's that's me. But uh, you know, I think I think it's interesting to see. So you start with Striper, but if you listen to Tantrum, you know Tantrum's not a not a Striper cover band uh, by any means. Not quite. And uh, <laughs> you're like, yeah, if I could do things differently, I would have made him a Striper cover <laughs> we band. Should yeah. have been right. But uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think what's interesting is you know obviously obviously you got into more extreme music you know you got into vengeance and uh and mortification and uh bands like that you know so what what was the uh what was the transition like for you going from you know being into stuff like striper to want something a little bit heavier something a little bit more extreme um like did that shock you at first cuz like i always well, think i always think <clears throat> back to this whenever i think about vengeance because like for me all that stuff was pretty much over by the time i was into music you know like everybody yeah. was like yeah you want heavy christian music you you go listen to you know uh, circle of dust or uh you know or or living sacrifice or zeo or or bands like that but from your perspective you were kind of there from the beginning so you heard you know human sacrifice you know, kind of as a new release, like, did that like yeah. scare you at all or shock Literally you at all? Me. Um, my, my, uh, parents were involved in youth group. So they, <clears throat> excuse me, they, um, had, I was always around kids that were, that were 16, 17, you know, when I was 10, you know, or whatever. So like, there was always kids that were older than me who were ahead of me with that stuff. Um, but the first time I heard human sacrifice was a dubbed copy and so I didn't have the privilege of pushing play on side one for a song. I got to hear the last song first. Beheaded? Beheaded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay. you can imagine my surprise coming from, you know, Petra and, and, and Whiteheart, um, who I, by the way, still love those groups. I still have an amazing or a major um, just uh, appreciation for. You can and, say it. You can say it hard on. Yeah. I got a <laughs> <laughs> I got a hard on for Whiteheart. There you go. No, um we all but, do. But I just, you know, I, I'm you know being 40 years old now, I'll be 41 now. Um I can appreciate the zealousness of the lyrics of those bands in the past and just sort of just how real they were about it. But so I've I've never never like treated this conversation with that attitude of like, well, I wasn't a striper, but then I got into this better stuff. Yeah. I, I've always, 
always kept the old music just as close as the the stuff that would that would be fresh to me now. Um, in fact, I was just jamming Newsboys with um, my daughter in the car the other day. Um, she loves that song "Shine" by the Newsboys. <laughs> so I, you know, I, you know, I just sort of like come full circle. But, um, but anyway, so I'm listening to Petra and all that stuff. So to imagine when you push play and you hear that song "Beheaded." And then you hear that ending where he does that scream and it scared me, man. I, I'm not exaggerating. I turned the cassette off. I couldn't even listen to it. Yeah. It scared me. So, but like anything that scares you, it also is intriguing. So yeah, it's, you know, I mean, I can tell you when I first saw the shining on television was I pushed play, I snuck the TV on and it was on cable and I, and seeing you, you, know, you turn it to the channel. And the first thing I saw was, was the scene where Jack Nicholson walks into room uh, two, three, seven or whatever it is. And, and sees the ghost in the tub, you know, that whole thing was like one of the scariest things in the world to see. Um, it was the same thing. It was like, I turned it off and ran out of the room and was traumatized. But then I went back and got more into it because, um, I was just so intrigued by it. Like, after you get through the shock of like, okay, you're alive. That was not actually real. <laughs> that didn't, it wasn't a something to really scare you, but then you can kind of go, well, what the heck was that? And then you go back to it. And, uh, quite literally for me, vengeance, um, and horror movies were <laughs> both played a, a role, you know, in that kind of thing for me. And I just sort of embraced that scary stuff a lot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's I, I had kind of the same thing the first time I heard like mortification, you know, was like just terrifying. And anybody that anybody that doesn't know what he's talking about with the scream on that, so like the first song you heard is beheaded, and that that song ends with Roger Martinez screaming, like literally screaming in pain, screaming like like ah! like, like screaming yeah. like like absolutely like a blood curdling shriek you just he just sounded like a madman yeah and like the lyrics are not that but like the lyrics are like he's like i want to see my head chopped off <laughs> you know you um, can literally picture like when you listen to his screech and you think about any like horror films where you see like a beheading or something or like a a guillotine come down on a head or something it's like you're hearing that sound yeah. Of that person's the last reaction. You can see the eyes bugging out of their skull and their mouth wide open. And that's the sound that Roger Martinez makes is that visual. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's traumatizing when you're like <laughs> 10 or whatever, how overall I was when but it came it, out. But at some point you move past being afraid and it, it becomes almost somewhat of a badge of pride, right? Like, you know, oh, you're totally, like, yeah. oh yeah, like because I remember, you know, we did a we did a Cannibal Corpse episode on discography discussion a while back, and I was like, you know, you take a song like Meat Hook Sodomy, you don't listen to that when you're by yourself. You wait until your boss is in the car with you, and <laughs> you put that song in, and you just you don't say anything. You mean the first <laughs> just, like two minutes? Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, meat yeah, Hook right Sodomy. Song. Yeah, like, like you know, you just you just put that in, you let it go, and <laughs> and because you, you you want everybody in the world to know what kind of a dude you are, <laughs> you know, and, uh, it, it's the perfect way. And like, it was always even more fun with bands like vengeance and even like mortification because you're like, yeah, but this is Christian music, you know? And you, so yeah. you always, you always had that caveat there, which was like in a certain way, like almost more offensive yeah. to people well, than, than just like a straight death metal band, like a malevolent creation or a, or a cannibal corpse or a carcass yeah. or something like that. It's funny that you keep comparing those bands because when I met Roger Martinez in 92, um, he was, he was at creation festival, which is like the most conservative Christian music festival. Like the most, most crazy band there, there would have been like one bad pig. And that was really extreme for them. Um, and bride was there and things like that. But, um, he was there and they wouldn't let the band play, but they let him preach. So I got to, I actually watched Roger Martinez preaching and, um, but his merch booth was set up. I, it's like if you, once you set the merch booth up, you might as well let the band play because the 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 merchandise was 
there was it was look it looked like a Slayer concert. It was as far as yeah. like how many shirts were available. He had he must have had like 20, 30 shirts up there on this huge wall, and all of them were just so evil looking. And he had um eaten back to life by Cannibal Corpse on the on the table with the lyrics open so you of can co- view of course he and did. compare. And I remember that was my discovery of Cannibal Corpse was at a Vengeance Rising sermon. <laughs> so, Thanks, Roger you know, Martinez. It, it's funny how that'll and again, you, you're seeing it and you're like, that's intriguing. I need to check out that band now because that's those lyrics are really crazy. Yeah. And it all it does is just it, it just it's always the opposite effect. You know, you would think Roger Martinez would know that, but you know, your parents never seem to know that. But right, you know, it's it's like when you say, you know, don't watch this or don't listen to this. Or don't drink alcohol or don't do this or don't, you know, yeah. that it, it tends to almost like, or I, I guess I, the way I should say it is if you, you package it in a way where it's, where it's um, not realistic, where a parent doesn't allow you to see it for what it is, then the curiosity takes over. Well, yeah, because I think, you know, our parents at the time were just trying to protect us from things yeah. that were unpleasant. But I think at the same time, you know, you look at something like Cannibal Corpse, and when your parents tell you, like, oh, it's terrible, don't ever get into this, this is this is bad or whatever, they're making it seem like it's this really important thing. Yeah. When in reality, it's it's no different than, like, um, like the Mad Magazine or the old, uh, the old, uh, Tales from the Crypt comic books. Like, that, it, that is, it, it's a very cartoony and un- unrealistic thing. Right. But your parents make it seem like it's so much more than that. And so you feed off of that. I mean, when you're in a Christian home, your parents will never understand that the guys in Cannibal Corpse are less, let alone even vengeance are, are just decent human beings. Regular people. But yeah. You can't view that either because you can't imagine that someone like Chris Barnes exists right. when you're 12 and that those types of, there's a human being that would sing about those types of things. You can't help but take it seriously at 12 in a Christian home. But then now you can go watch it on YouTube and you can hear them talking about all that. And they're all like snuggling with their kids and they're talking about, yeah, it was just a part we played. It's a character. None of yeah. it was real. It's a and you, you get that. Yeah. But you know, then you, it was, there was no way out because you're not going to understand that. And certainly your parents aren't going to understand that. And so the, that combination just kept you in a constant state of curiosity where you're, where you're, you're just, you want to get closer to the thing that you can't understand, which is exactly the problem because, you know, and it's like if, if your dad would just pull the beer out in front of you and say, this is beer, take a sip. Isn't it gross? Yeah, it's gross. Exactly. And well, I don't know about all that, but yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's wonderful now, but when as a 12 year old, yeah, as a 12 year old, you're like, well, plus your dad never drank good beer. Right. So he drinks, like Bud Light or something or Budweiser Corona. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Corona would have been a step up from my, I mean, my dad, my dad used to have like a, a case in his closet of like a, some cheap 30 pack of something gross, you know? And, and I would, I remember sneaking in and tasting one and being like, Bleh! like I hated it, but you know, if he would have just showed it to me, it would have been like, you know, that the, was back the, before the, there were the, cool craft beers. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. I probably would have hated them more though, because there's there's so much flavor to them. Dude, I'm so yeah, I'm still such a craft beer snob. It's ridiculous. But uh I love I see I can't drink beer enough to not be a craft beer snob because I can't like if I buy a case, I it lasts me months and months because I can really only drink one or two because I'm just I don't have a very uh my stomach doesn't I can't really have a lot of that in my stomach at once. So it's I don't I just, for me, it's like, if you're going to have a beer on occasion, then buy a good beer. Like, don't, <laughs> don't get a case of crap, you know? I don't know, man. I bought some gas station beer. I didn't buy it, but, uh, I, uh, <laughs> some, some hooch. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> like the, with the bag. It, yeah. It's uh, it's gas station beer, but, um, the old English, you know, it's, it's funny you say that one or two and you're just watching me throw one, one after another, after another back on Skype. But, uh, what's funny is, uh, yeah. <laughs> what's funny is that like, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, about Christian music and Christian bands, you know, like being, being the influence. Was that something that you like 
stuck to or or did you actively at that time you know as a kid listening to music like did you go out and seek the other stuff or was it just like i'm gonna stay with christian music because that's something that's important to me well <clears throat> okay so i'm i'm a little bit of a rarity in that i didn't get to a point where i was like it's okay to listen to this secular music it's not gonna be any different i didn't get to that point until quite a while into my youth. So like, um, I stuck to Christian music, not necessarily because of, of, uh, convinced that it was the only way, but, but mostly just out of convenience because it was just the easiest thing to find in my circle of, of life, you know, of people I hung out with. It was youth group kids. They all had cassettes of, of bands. Tooth and nail records hadn't happened yet. And that plays a big part in this crossover because, Tooth and Nail Records is the first time Christian music was marketed to Christians coming from a, a, a genre of music that was, or, or just a list of bands that were playing big into Seattle and the Nirvana blow explosion and all that stuff. So um, even though bands like that were, were already out there, like Melvin's was way already out there, but we didn't know about them yet because we were still listening to Christian music. So right. But, but, you know, the comp, the, it was like the happy storm of you're becoming a teenager, your, um, music culture is just changing around you, regardless of your bubble of Christian school and all that. And just the natural, you know, magnus magnetism towards something new, something else, you know, it's all that happening at the same time for me was the nineties explosion tooth and nail came along and wish free and came out focused came out starfire 59 came out those bands all just out of nowhere just were in my face i'd already liked the 77s and already gotten into uh, daniel amos and the choir and things that were that were alternative rock but um actually the the big crossover just to keep this in the sequence order we went from striper to vengeance the, the big uh, third the holy trinity of of music that blew my mind. The third would be Scattered Fuse, Sin Disease. Okay, that was that was marketed, created by people who were completely in the world of the secular industry. Like the band members did not have a an ounce of Christian culture. Like they were not they were not like Christian guys who were trying to be in a Christian band. Like there was none of that. Like Scattered Fuse was one or two people who were who were running it who were Christians. Most of the people weren't Christians and their entire package was, we're trying to bring you this real thing. That's like, like the mean streets of Los Angeles drug scene and like the punk scene of this world of the eighties and the nineties. We're bringing this into the gospel music. <laughs> we're going to bring the gospel. We're t I mean, I guess they were just trying to take the gospel to the darker places, but because the record, deal was that they came out in Christian bookstores. People were like, well, this is, this can't be Christian music. Cause they're just insane. Right. But, people aren't buying this at Walmart. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at the picture of the band 1990 and you see Alan Aguirre or at the time he was known as uh Ronald Dumpkis, you know, with his eyebrows, sh eyebrows shaved and he had, with a big uh, ring in his eyebrow and dreadlocks and makeup. I mean, it's, I mean, it was like Marilyn Manson level, like shock, viewing of someone's look at sure. the time and, and just blew my mind. could not believe this. And their music was like Jane's addiction and David Bowie and Bauhaus and all this stuff. I didn't know anything about at the time. I mean, I knew a little bit about Bowie, but you know what I mean? Like you just, you just, that was, that was getting thrown into my face, like in this package that was just so intense. And then, so then it's like, you're looking at the record label they're on. Well, who else is on that record label? Oh, a band called Poor Old Lou, a band called, um, you know, or whatever, whoever was on that label. So it's like, and then you get into the 77s and all that, that sort of pre tooth and nail, um, punk hardcore and, uh, alternative music. There's, there's, well, there's a lot of that like was, the crucify would be another example. Yeah. You know? A lot of that was like intense records, right? Intense records. Yeah. But see, intense records was a lot strict, strict to the metal side. Like there wasn't okay. a lot of hardcore and punk from intense, not till a little later, but 
like mortal obviously would be an exception to the rule. Um, six feet deep for the hard six core. feet deep. Yeah. yeah but, but see that, but that was after tooth and nail. Cause, cause, um, I mean, it was like right after tooth and nail, but like a year, but, uh, but, uh, but still like there was no of, there was none of that yet. Like it was just like a real small handful. It was crucified. It was scatter few. It was this band called, um, um, uh, the lead. Um, there was like a few of these bands that you saw that, but, but not enough that it took over for you. You right. know, it's got a few blew my mind and then I just went seeking it. But then, you know, fast forward another year or two, 93, then tooth and nail comes out. Now you're getting helmet. Now you're getting the hardcore and the punk stuff like full blast. Now you're getting Fugazi and Jawbox type of music right. in your face. You and got still, like focused you, and yeah. And then you get the recommended if you likes. You get the you get the pamphlet in the mail and it says oh, recommend yes. if you like. And then you see those bands listed. And now you're you're you know, fourteen or well, let's see. It was I was sixteen and ninety four actually. So so yeah, you're I'm I'm almost pushing driving age at this point. And I'm seeing the recommended if you like list. And now I'm just I'm just a sponge. I'm just, I'm just sucking up everything and anything. And I'm going like just full blast into the, the recommended if you like list. So now I'm, I'm being introduced to bands like Mr. Bungle because of bands like don't know. And I'm, and I'm, and Primus Primus because of bands like, uh, like don't know, don't know was a band on tooth and nail. That was, um, members of Blenderhead. Blenderhead was another huge one for me. Um, you know, recommended if you like Jawbox, and recommended if you like Fugazi. Oh, well, let me go check those bands out. So, that, you know, and it just, just, and it was like a floodgate just opened. Meanwhile, I'm in high school or, you know, middle school and then into high school with Rick, who would be my drummer in Tantrum. And he and I are going through this experience at the same time of like, oh my God, dude, you got to hear this cassette. Listen to this band. Oh my God. And then, you know, Im- just imagine in, just a few years, like a, maybe a two to three year window, it all just dumps down on you at once. It is the absolute reason why the heart is a two at its sperm sounds the way it does because it's just we're we're just coming into the high, coming out of the high school or into high school, getting to the end of high school, and we're just being bombarded because now Christian music is just blowing up with this stuff, but we're also getting everything that wrote the book that inspired these bands. Right. So you're getting it on, I'm getting it on both sides where most people may have just came up with like Metallica and Soundgarden and whatever. So it wasn't like this beat over the head, but it's like, you know, you walk into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory and you just see it now all in front of you. And you're just like running and jumping into the chocolate and grabbing the lollipops and grabbing the gummies. And you're just like grabbing it all. So you would have been one of the kids that was eliminated from the. I'm the fat kid that drove down the river. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Just, just so that I got that on tape. Okay. Yeah. I would definitely not have made it to own the chocolate factory at the end of that movie. All all. right. Yeah. That would, I was negligent with this. I would have destroyed it all. That would have been, that would have been the dude from Starflyer, right? He, he's the guy that got the, got the chocolate factory. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. What's interesting is, is that like, you know, you say all that and, when I listen to Tantrum, though, like I don't hear, um, I don't hear a Tooth and Nail band. I, I don't hear a, you know, um, like a punk. Ro- like, okay, I definitely hear punk rock. Uh, that's there. Uh, but with Tantrum, what what I found interesting is that, like, you guys, especially on especially on that first record, you know, the heart is a two headed sperm. Like, were you guys like trying to piss people off? Um. I'm not saying I was pissed off, but like I could understand. We didn't start out with that intention, but okay. what, <clears throat> what happened is, so, you know, you're, there's the, there's the, the musical and artistic explosion in our brains that is happening. But then there's also, um, just growing up with stuff that didn't make any sense. Like, you know, the kind of Christian stuff we came up with, you know, you got to understand. So, so you, when you finally, get it to an age where you're, you're experiencing more than the sheltered Christian world around you or whatever. Not that my parents like were made us like, you know, like we were in bubbles or something. It wasn't like that. It was so just, not, not like my parents. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like our, my parents did their best to try and bring me up with positive lyrics, positive Christian music, wanted me to, to just, you know, not be, you know, going to Ozzy Osbourne concerts. So, I mean, I get it, but like, 
when you finally come across all of that stuff and you almost feel like, man, like I didn't know all this existed. Then, then there's also a bit of a backlash because then you're like, you feel like you missed out on something or whatever. So you, you know, and then add in the fact that, you know, we're going to Christian school, we're on the private school and then we're trying to wear, I'm trying to wear my tourniquet psychosurgery shirt to school and they are telling me that it's demonic and you know, you're, you, I'm getting to that age where I'm getting defiant and, rebellious, whatever, you know, and then the combination of musical styles that we're all getting into all at once. And just, and then obviously the dream of being a rock star from striper way back in the eighties is still there. And it just has only grown. And now the overwhelming, uh, feeling of just all of this music hitting you and inspiring you, you can't help, but want to create your own. You'd see, you start to try to play instruments and you are terrible at it. I switched from drums, which I was actually pretty good of a drummer. Um, but I switched to guitar because Rick was a drummer and I was closer. I had a guitar already and could play some, some power chords. He couldn't play guitar at all. He had nothing. He just had drums and he was a, I mean, I'll just say he was, a, he was a terrible drummer at the time, but, oh, but he no. was also, he was like 13. So, I mean, we, he ex- obviously bloomed into an amazing drummer, but, um, but at the time, you know, we were just kids trying to play. I remember trying to play Sanity Obscure by Believer on a guitar with like three strings on it. <laughs> totally out of tune. Just dance, 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 dance. That's like the only thing I could do, oh obviously. And like Rick just was playing this awful drum beat and stuff. But but like, you know, we just kept at it, kept at it till we finally could just figure out how to play a little bit. And, you know, fast forward two, three years of just trying, you know, we were like, well, let's play punk rock. Cause that's easy, you know? Right. And then like, you know, so much of that was getting popular anyway. And so, yeah, it was just like everything, man. It was like all just hitting you, you know, you're questioning your Christian authority and your public school, private school. You went through satanic panic period, you know, and found that it was all just a bunch of BS, you know, again, yeah, I the, lived rock, through that. The, the rock and hell's bells and rock and roll search for God videos that your youth groups playing just as letting you're just getting into all the music it's telling you not to listen to, you know, like the cure and, you know, um, all the bask, all the back masking stuff they would do on there. It got me real obsessed with just that yeah, and how creepy it sounded. And of course we would start to experiment with that in tantrum. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We've there's hit, there's hidden messages all over. Uh, well, there's, blat- there's blatant messages too. Like the thing that, the thing that stands out to me is like that first song, not the first song, the second song. Um, and I'm trying to remember what it's called because I suck. Uh, let's see. Which album? Oh, Two Hooded Sperm. Yeah, we, uh, I was referring to modern music when I said the backmasking. Yeah, but um, we didn't we didn't do anything like that on the. Oh, well, we do. We do have some backmasking on on the first song, but it's just like one. It's a it's a sound of a of feedback and a and a bass guitar going backwards, but it's not like uh messages or anything like that well i'm talking about specifically the the devil's house of techno and the yeah. the, the sound clips on that like oh, that, the samples yeah oh my goodness like and so we you know like so i remember whenever we first had you on discography discussion uh and we and so like at that at that time i was the only member of that podcast that uh that had heard tantrum of the muse and was like a fan you know, and uh, I'm trying to sell you to these guys. Like, what you know? Why are we having this guy on? Who is he? What what band has he been Tough in? Sell, you know? man. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I I got my way. I always do, right? Uh, but like, <laughs> I remember showing him that song, and I remember Jeff after hearing like the the first the opening sound clip was like, yeah, I'm in. He sounds cool. Let's do it. You know what I mean? And, so uh, late in the game, too. It's yeah. funny. That was like, what, two years ago or something? Or? Two, two, three years ago. It's It's been yeah. a minute, yeah. But what was funny is, uh, it like, Tantrum always went places that I feel like other Christian bands didn't go. You know, like, when you're like, they're looking for a great place to go on a date. How about a weenie roast? <laughs> like, <laughs> And I remember just being like, you know, um, and you and I, you and I had only been talking for a little while, you know, before that, but I was like, no, I mean, I was like, it seems very much in his personality, you know, to, to throw something like that out there. And then, you know, he's like, and then they get to the point where it's like, 
you make me feel like a kid in the back of a car. And then, and then, so then you have the entire song and then there's a point in the song where you say like, you know, now that we're married, you know, like I'll devote my lusting to you. And then you do this like disgusting, like it just almost sounds like a fat guy, like breathing heavily into the mic, you know? And, um, and then it was a fat guy. <laughs> was it? Oh, okay, cool. It was yeah, a fat perfect. Guy. Well, it wasn't exactly the thinnest kid in the, uh, I the thought band. I, I thought I heard myself in there a little bit. Yeah. So <laughs> there was, there was that, um, but then, you know, and then at the end of it, you know, they're like, they, they like sound disappointed or whatever. And it's like, well, you know, I guess, uh, I guess people have been dealing with this since Adam left the, left Adam and Eve left the garden, you know? And I remember like that, you know, when I first heard that, you know, when I was younger, you know, back closer to when the record came out, I remember just thinking like, these guys just don't give a damn. Like they, they are just going to, they are just going to go there. And talk about yeah. something that I had never really heard a Christian rock band talk about. Yeah, and I, I mean, thought that kinda, was really interesting. Yeah, to answer your the other question, which I did not answer very well, but basically to kind of summarize, because you're you're still hitting on the point is so like, you know, we're we're in we're in school and all the music stuff's happening, but we're also kind of rebelling and stuff, and we don't we didn't have a really good track record with churches and stuff. A lot of stuff happened to both of us, me and Rick. Um we had a guy in a band named Jason Stalford, who I just recently connect, connected with, by the way, after 20 years, my r- original bass player. And man, it was crazy cool to finally talk to him again and see him again. But um, the three of us, I should say at the time, were just kind of going through so much weird stuff. And um, so there was anger. There was some stuff like that. Um, no, we did not try to create a band to shock and make people – be offensive to people. But what happened was I became very sympathetic to the ADHD culture because I was, I was experiment. I was experimented on a lot because it was sort of a still becoming a thing that you get to figure out. And your parents were trying to understand what was wrong with you and all this stuff. A lot of it was just confusion of spiritual stuff and, um, wanting to be creative, not a kid who plays sports and that kind of stuff is not, always understood. And, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm got a lot of, I was on a lot of medication. I was on, um, I joked with people I, that, you know, that I was on drugs when I wrote the hardest of two at its sperm, but it was just like Ritalin. Yeah. <laughs> well, Butrin, you know, well, like you know you're not wrong. Those are drugs. <laughs> Those are drugs. Yeah. I mean, they affected your brain. They certainly, they certainly played a part in, in sort of the weird way I saw things and interpreted things. Um, the, just the album title and what I, what that meant to me and why I would ever call it that just stuff like that was coming from a, a, uh, ADHD kind of treatment issue. And, and so I was, um, very sympathetic to that struggle and kids who didn't feel like they belonged and all that stuff. So it was a lot of, um, just feeling like I needed to say some statement. And so like, we all just felt musically we had we had already discovered bands like today's the day and neurosis and you know melvins and things so there was that coming into it and it was just all of the musical bombshell mixed with the spiritual um confusion and the sort of just trying to understand what it means to be kind of like a teenager and 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 there's kids there's things that are happening that are bigger than just our christian bubble you know we there was always you know and at that time i I remember it was like a big deal like talking about racism talking about um suicide and depression and i always was around that world of depression and suicide and that's those thoughts because of the adhd depression and the just sort of all the stuff, the disorders and the things you think you you, you hear about yourself that you're not, you don't think the same or you're not as mentally uh, stable as you're supposed to be. And all this stuff that makes you think like you're not together or you're broken in some way. And so those songs are, are really just like high school angst songs of um, just wanting to say something real, say something that felt real at the time to you. And, you know, it's weird because on one hand, Tantrum of the Muse was just like this attitude. But on the other hand, if you really listen to it, there was this super naive 
like uh, we were, it's almost like we were, we were just foolishly naive about things in the world and tried to figure it out on, on the album, you know? Right. So like on one, so like there was like, you're hearing, you're hearing songs that are making you think like we're, we don't give a shit about anything, but we were really emotionally uh, sensitive. So (laughs) that those two things don't normally coexist, but they did with us. And so, but to answer your question about the, the offensiveness and all, it just started to happen. We, we wanted to express ourselves and the ideas we had and the weird, dark ways we interpreted things just became controversial to people. And then we liked that and we grew into, we, we um, fed into that. And certainly when Jim entered the picture and Jason was out and him, him being nine years older than us. So he was 29 when I met him, um, when I met Jim and he was like an adult, he was married, he had two kids and he's going through a, a divorce, you know, and all this dark stuff, all these super dark things. Um, Tantrum's second album was a bit more mean spirited, I think. And we were playing, we were playing, we were playing, we were playing into the, the, um, reputation. Whereas the first album was not like that. The first album was, was us purely just trying to create this thing and it came out the way it did. And then the reputation became its thing. It be kind of tantrum kind of became bigger than us in some way. Like you said, you heard rumors about us that some were just absolutely insane. Um, all, it all just became a reputation where we would be, we'd be playing in States away from our house. We'd be, I, I remember we played in, uh, we drove all the way to um, Memphis and we played some dive bar with few left standing. And um, Arthur from living sacrifice showed up because he was in Esoteris or maybe he was still in that. I, I can't remember when they broke up, but he was from that band. He was yeah. most known from that band. He had just joined living sacrifice, but he's standing there and he comes out to the show because he's heard he hears he's hearing stuff about us, and he and he's talking to me and he says, "Oh, you're in that band, oh man," and I and then he I said, "Well, what band are you in?" He tells me, "I'm in Living Sacrifice," and I was obsessed with Living. I loved Inhabit, I loved Non-existent and all that stuff. So and Reborn was out already. So I was like, so that's the card I to drop. Yeah, I couldn't believe that someone from Living Sacrifice was there at the show I was playing. So it was just like this, you know what I mean? It was just like we were a reputation that was spread across the country before we even got to those, those places, you know? And, and so that reputation just fueled us and made us more mean spirited. And we kind of liked playing like the villain role of, we wanted to be a dangerous band and you're in, in a Christian scene. How dangerous can you really be? Reality being, we were actually one of the safest bands. Um, We had a big mouth, but we, we weren't doing some of the things that some of the innocent bands were but doing. Theologically, it was uh, theologically no backed up with something. Yeah, right. Well, we, you know, like you know, the scene at a, at the scene in the hotel for for Tantrum and the Muse was we were sitting around, probably having a beer or two once in a while because we were of age. We were old enough. We weren't like underage. Sure. <clears throat> and and watching stupid movies or something. Um. We were at Cornerstone Festival. We were selling our albums, and parents were bringing the CDs back to our tables and demanding the money back, while their kids stood there with their heads down, embarrassed. And we were having these conversations with parents, like, you know, we, um, you know, this is what we mean by this or that or whatever. And and it was just sort of a weird, like I said, emotionally sensitive, but also mean spirited in places. And sure. so when parents would confront us, we would be the emotionally sensitive, but you know, what they were looking at was not that. So meanwhile, we're the, we're the band that's causing all the trouble apparently. But, um, we go back to our hotel at Cornerstone festival and the main, the main stage gospel CCM selling band that's making thousands and thousands of dollars and all of the parents are ecstatic that their kids listen to were going back to the hotels and they were trying to have sex with our friends, you know? So that's the reality. You know, we, we were a reputation and we were, a we were, we, we were up front and playing a villainous role, I guess, or the bad guys or the, the, uh, the troublemakers of Christian music, but we were probably the most behaved band you'd meet. 
for us, it was like fart jokes for us. Wow. You know, like we, we played pranks on people. We would put, we do gross things to people's cars or, or, um, you know, stick stuff in people's, um, you know, in their car, you know, like we smear poop on their windshield or something, you know, like we were right, doing sure. gross stuff like that. Like we were road antics or like having food battles or throwing fireworks into people's cars and stuff. That was us, but we weren't, we weren't like sex, drugs and rock and roll. Like people would have, would assume we were. And, um, certainly me and Rick weren't that way. I mean, Jim certainly was off the deep end in some areas, but that's another story. Let him tell that one. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think, uh, what was, you know, some of the rumors that I heard, you know, and this is just me being like a, like a scene kid, you know, at that time and hearing that like people were afraid to tour with Tantra and the Muse because, you know, they, at one point they like poured gasoline on somebody and set somebody on fire. Did that, <laughs> did so, that really happen i mean like let's well you know i got you now man you can't get away you got to tell me like did this happen well, no <laughs> we would never do that to anybody okay what, what we did it to a pig head and put it on our album cover i guess that might have got sent right down yeah the yeah the cover of the bit, album but... is a flaming pig head but like i want to say i heard that before <laughs> the second album came out and so I remember Let like seeing the album cover and being like, well, of course, you know? Like, <laughs> okay. So here's my recollection of that because I, he I heard that same rumor. And what's the, the funny thing is, so, so I'm walking around at Cornerstone in the dark. This is the, the, the summer of 2000. This is the summer we were going to go on tour with, um, under oath narcissists and feel of standing under the banner of the 40 days of disaster, which was, more like 60 to 70 days of disaster. <laughs> I have tons of tour posters of this, by the way, if anybody wants a poster from that tour, let me know. Cause I, I have a bunch of them. Uh, as hey, all, Steven, as all, I want a poster from that tour. It's the take whole records promotional tour poster of all four bands on it. And it has that little spot below where it says playing at, you know, but, um, anyway, so we were starting that tour. We all met up at cornerstone and we knew we were all going on tour together, but none of us knew each other yet. We, we knew feel left standing first because we had played a year before in Alabama and gotten signed to take hold and played take hold fest and got, and we stayed with, um, we got to stay with Aaron, the bass player, feel left standing him and his family and just got super close with them to this day. They're some of my favorite guys in the bands that we we've, um, I still talk to them on occasion through Facebook and on where I consider them still close. Um, but then um, we met Narcissus on the way to Cornerstone that year. Um, we played a show in Ohio as a pit stop on the way. And that's when we played with them. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, we met Narcissus because they played, they recorded their album, New Wave Tech Techno Homicide. New Wave Techno Homicide, yeah. They, they recorded that. At the, at the exact same studio as us when we did modern music, but they did it. They were, they were, they came in like a few days after we finished. So we had, we were walking out and they were walking in and I met narcissist there at that studio. Um, I think we may have been the contact with that studio. That was, um, Nick Rotundo, by the way, who, who passed away from a brain aneurysm or something a, a couple years ago, but he was a great guy. He recorded a lot of Boyce that's fire. Um, he recorded a ton of the Huntington albums. Um, just, a, just a lot of stuff like that. And, uh, he did blast of the rock man's, uh, the monster who ate Jesus album. Um, I was, I was part of that session. It's um, a great album. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful album. And then, um, so he did modern music. That's how we got into that studio. Kind of like jumping all over the place here, but anyway, so we met narcissists through that. And then, um, we were all label mates, so we were excited. So we played a show with them in Ohio. So now we've broken the ice with two of the three. Now, we did not get to talk to or meet Under Oath yet. We knew who they were. Um, they had just put out Cries, Cries of the Past. It's like the big the big black metal album or whatever. Um, it's great. And it, and it was kind of like in this, in this, in the, it was in the air that they were kind of like the bigger band of the four clearly they were bigger than us they were they were a rising star at that time they yeah. were rising stars and i think they i think they thought that they were headlining that tour though they were not <laughs> um um so we get i'm walking around cornerstone after all this this is the same summer like a few days later and we're all at cornerstone it's going to be like the beginning of the tour 
all of our albums are coming out and um, uh, I'm walking around in the dark and I see some guys walking ahead of me and um, one of them trips and falls. Oh no. And I run up to them like just natural instinct. Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm cool. I'm cool. Oh man. Oh, cool. I just want to make sure you're all right. It's look like that hurt. Yeah. 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 we got the talking and it's uh, I think it was Dallas and Chris if my memory serves from under Earth. And we're talking and they don't even know who I am. I don't know who they are. We're just talking because I saw them trip and I was trying to help them. And then after, after a, a minute or there, just kind of shaking off the dust and being like, Oh yeah, yeah. Who are you? Who are you here for? Blah, blah, blah. Um, it just, someone introduced the other and then we realized who we were. And then it was like, Oh man, we're all going on tour together. Yeah. 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 And we got all excited and, and we're hitting it off and we're having a great old time and laughing and, and I, and I think it was Dallas that said, you know, we were so nervous about going on tour with you guys because we heard <laughs> the craziest things. Um, we heard that you guys like set somebody on fire. And another story we heard was that you had, uh, you had super glued somebody to another person. And I'm like standing there just like, what are they talking about? And what, what I think got misconstrued is the cover of the album was a pig head that was on fire. Somehow that got interpreted into we burned somebody else. I don't, I don't remember <laughs> now. Now the truth is we did to each other hurt ourselves. We like, we um, did light fire bombs in the car and throw them at each other. Yeah. Like, like we would crumble up something light on fire and just throw it at the person driving and they would fall on their lap and they'd be like, Oh God, God, and throwing the fire off of them real fast while they're driving. We're like thinking that's hysterical in the back, just dumb stuff like that. But that wasn't like, dousing somebody in gasoline i mean what the what the hell did anybody think that was true it's it's crazy i mean it's like the telephone game i mean i believed it pretty much it's like it was it yeah. wasn't as easy back then to um you could to, go to online and listen to a me. podcast yeah, exactly. of somebody explaining <laughs> like it. this yeah. conversation <laughs> you get you gotta wait like yeah. 20 years yeah but then the other thing with the super glue was because um while we were we'd be driving someone would take super glue like that stuff that's real strong, like the nail glue. Yeah, and um, would would take something and glue it to someone's neck. <laughs> I think it was Jim had had glued something to my neck or Rick's neck while we were driving, and it, like it immediately bonds your skin, and you have to like pull it off, and it almost. <laughs> I remember at one point we pulled someone pulled it, and it like cut the skin a little bit, and they were bleeding. But it was you know like it was stupid stuff. It wasn't like like what they thought we were. So <laughs> they, they come to find out we're like super chill guys and we're not these psychotic. I mean, but the reputation of tantrum and muse is hilarious. It's just hilarious. It was just, it was just like, we didn't have to do anything because we would do a few things and it would just get it overblown. Then you'd do an album cover like the one we did. And then, you know, you know, and then the story of that got published on message boards of how we did that album cover. And, I've gone public a few times to tell the stories. I think it's hysterical and, and just, you know, and then the album comes out, people see the art, people were writing to us saying, that's not real. Yo, it was real. Oh, It's very real. And, and we, and we I, definitely it, set a pig's head on fire. We've, yeah. we've got the pictures, all lots of pictures to prove it. Um, but, um, it, yeah, just, I guess just it all at the same time just sort of happened, but no, we were, we were super chill. I think for the most part, um, the problems didn't come to later for us with well, things then, that would destroy this eventually. You guys but, were on, uh, you guys were on take hold, right? That was, yeah, your, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was both the albums on take hold. Did, did take did any of those rumors or anything ever get back to take hold? Were they like, you know, you guys can't do this or were, did they ever basically give you guys any trouble as far as like, what I would interpret as a listener, like what your image was. Well, um, so we were originally put in a studio by a sofa records, which is a Philadelphia based label that was putting out, um, pink daffodils, redeem speedy delivery. Who else was on that label? Um, I mean, those were like, Oh, and 121. So that was like, kind of like the main Philadelphia scene at the time. Um, they had, they had seen us play in 98. It was like literally our first show. And Jason started a spit 
spit bomb battle with the crowd and the crowd spit all over the place. Yeah. Just literally spit everywhere. <laughs> and the venue made us clean it up. We we're like mopping the floor, like literally mopping the floor. You're like, this is and why it, I signed up to be in a rock and roll band. Yeah. Right. Right. We were, uh, we were already on our way with great, uh, reputations. Um, we played with, we played with crutch, which would become a Lathian later, as you know. Yeah. Um, but they were, this is pre Travis. This is like, this is like, they were almost a hardcore band with a metal guitarist. Yeah. I think it was um, either you or Travis that gave me their original demo. I was very surprised. Yeah, I have it. I don't know if I gave it to you, but I have it. I think um, you did. Yeah. Yeah. I might've, um, there's a couple EPs there before Travis came into it. But anyway, um, they played 121 played speed delivery played and we were the opening band and we played maybe five songs or something. And we used to be called ruckus. So it was like the first time we played live as tantrum and the muse. And, um, uh, Bob from sofa records came up and said, Hey, I really like you guys. I think we should do something. And he put us in the studio and we recorded, the the hardest to it is sperm. We didn't even have it written yet. We were like, all right, yeah, give us some time. We'll go make an album. We'll, we'll turn it in. Okay, cool. We did that, turned it in and then silence. And then he's, you know, we're like, Hmm, we gave him the album and didn't hear back from him. So, um, I reached out to him and he said, um, it's, it's, it's cool. Um, but I'm hearing a lot of like weird background whispering and a lot of noises you're like, yep. are they are they supposed to be on there? Was that a mistake? Were they meant to be cut out? No, no, man, that's all supposed to be there. Isn't it cool? <laughs> oh, oh, okay, yeah, okay. So then, like you know, he starts to stall on putting this album out, and I, it, like a year went by, literally, where he it got to the point where we just started making our own copies. So now we're bootlegging our own stupid album, and we're putting this thing out, and it's our and it's picking up, man. People are like loving this thing and the you know this is the the magazine culture the zine culture whatever so people are putting out reviews and it's getting all over the place and and this the stupid thing wasn't even out yet so we go to cornerstone 98 wait was it 98 yes 98 with it yeah, i'm sorry yeah we had to finish we went to cornerstone 98 but we didn't we didn't play yet we were just driving around because when we, we had just finished it in 98 and Jim joined the band right as we were making it. So it was just me and Rick on that album. And, um, Jim was our live bassist immediately following finishing it. And, but we weren't ready to play Corson. Corson 99, we were already gigging a year with the album as a bootleg. And, um, so we show up at Cornerstone on a, like a Wednesday and it hadn't even started yet. And it was a bunch of ska bands with a generator and they were doing like a little ska afternoon pre cornerstone concert. Cause everyone was just gearing up to p- watch co- bands play. It was like the excitement was in the air. And um, we walked up to those guys and we said, Hey, do you guys care if we just do a impromptu little set with your, with your generator? Yeah, sure. No problem. So we set up and we're playing, and this is right next to the skate ramp, the infamous skate ramp. And um, we start, we, we had our backs turned everybody because we were just kind of like setting up and we just went into the, the song called Victoria has a secret, which was not on an album yet. We didn't do it. Right. Yet. Um, and we turned around and that song's like a minute long. Yeah. Like a minute and a half long. We turned around and there were literally hundreds of people standing there watching us. Oh boy. There were people standing on the, the campers on the roof. Cause they couldn't get see us close enough. I'm not exaggerating, man. It was like the spirit was in the air. Something exciting was happening with this band. And we launched into a set and we just played like in this hot steaming weather. We played full, like black pants, black shirts, like, like the whole presentation of, you know, the dark band that we were or whatever and just sweating (laughs) to death and going crazy. And we played like, and I had this mic stand back then. It was a shotgun that was going into my mouth and the mic was at the very end. So it just looked like I was singing with a gun in my mouth. So this presentation just went over wonderfully, of course. And people were just like, what the hell is this? And Andrew from crash dog was the guy who ran underground stage he was in a band called Bally Dallas. Um, he came up right after we played. And this dude does not give a crap. 
Like he gets banned demos all the time. He gets bands giving him CDs saying, can we play? Can we play? And he just like, he filters all that out. He doesn't care. Right. He says, get in line like the rest of us submit. We'll listen to your demo. If we like you, we'll invite you to play for next year. That's how he he'd play by those rules. He came up to us like a, like a schoolboy, And he's like, dude, you guys are on the stage next year. No, it's or ands or buts. If you want it, you have it. He's like in the, my entire year, years of being at, at Cornerstone, I've never seen kids stop skateboarding on the skate ramp to watch a band play. He's like, that's just never happened in my time here. So we were just excited about that. We we're like, wow, man, we we're on to something here. This is, this is getting really exciting. So then we get to play a, a take hold records or I'm sorry, a label showcase where we got to play in front of several record labels. One of them being tooth and nail records who we had just turned down, by the way, figure this stupid thing out. We, we are inspired by tooth and nail. By the time we get to it, we're now we're playing the role of, Oh, you know what? You want us to change our lyrics. You want us to change our artwork and our song titles and our album title. Mm, we'll pass. Cause we're changing. So, so was that a thing? Like yeah, tooth really and nail happened. was yeah. like, mm-hmm. you got to change your lyrics. You got to change your album. You, we wanted to be on that label in the worst way. We sent them. We were so proud of uh, the album. We sent it to them, and they responded, unlike Sofa Records. <laughs> right, so, right. Um, so uh, we got all excited, and and it was I think it was Bill Power, actually, from Blenderhead, if I can remember this carefully. But um, he said, listen, we, I think we want to sign you guys. We're really into this. But we, we it's between you guys and a band called Shorthanded. Okay. And he's like, what we need you to do is to change your song, t- some of your song titles, change your lyrics, change your album title, and re-record the whole album over again. And you're like way too punk rock for that, right? That's exactly it. We were way too punk rock, um, much to our own dismay, I, I think now, looking back. Though, part of me is proud of it, but part of me is also like, well, what could have been? We probably would have been a bigger band, but we would have probably... Tooth and Nail would be reissuing your album on vinyl next week. And you know, <laughs> I really doubt that <laughs> people people would have bought four copies of it. Yeah. If you want to talk about the vinyl reissue, bring it back up later. But I'll uh, but I'll um, okay. You pause, and I'm gonna go get a drink, and then we'll Sounds back good. to this. All right. So they said, yeah, it's between you and shorthanded, but we need you to change all this stuff. And we were like, no way, man, no. We're proud of what we did. We're tantrum. You can't change our our art, you know, whatever. Um, and they shorthanded has released albums on take <laughs> or on tooth and nail. So you can see how that went. Um, so then, but then um, they showed up anyway, though, at this label showcase at Cornerstone. Um, but we were looking at take hold by then because take hold was looking to do something different and and unique um that was not happening at the time they want they were really interested in taking good bands with the gospel message or (laughs) something ish like that um to to cross their whole their whole vision was like let's take this the mainstream and this and the christian and bring them all together and just be a scene right we loved that that was like our bread and butter um Because at the time we were working on a, a split EP. Well, no, not at the time, but soon after when we signed, we were we were trying to do a split EP with ten days a day. So that, to us, that kind of a label would made make sense. So we we spoke to them and and they they seemed pretty interested and they they really liked the album and um, we just they just wanted to see us live. So they came out. Um, Tooth and Nail was there. I remember Jeff Suffering was there and Matt Johnson from Blenderhead and Roadside were there. Um, with some of the tooth and nail people. And there were some other labels, some other independent stuff that was happening. Um, and we started playing and we were like, you know what? We're going to go all out. We're going to play. Um, we were wearing like black long pants, black everything. We had these metal bracelets. We were like so ridiculous. And we were just like full blast, like in J- July, Illinois heat, just, huh. just, swelteringly hot high 90s heat we were just like pretending like we were we didn't there was no heat there we were just going all crazy 
full blast. And we were just all 100% into it. And then we get to the song on the, the Devil's um, Devil's House of Techno, where it stops and the bass goes boom, 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 ding, ding, boom, ding, 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 ding. You know that part? Yeah. Um, where it's so it's so we you know me and Rick are like da da da, and we stop and Jim's supposed to do his little bass thing. Well, we go da da da, and it's just like silence. And we turn around, Jim's passed out on the ground, feedback oh, yeah. and all like. His bass is like laying there, just feedbacking, and he's on the ground. And we're like, "Oh no, what happened?" So he's passed out on the ground. And then, when you the thing about adrenaline is when you're so adren full, you know, force adrenaline, and then you stop, then you realize how sick you really are. So we got really sick, and um, I grabbed a bottle of uh, I grabbed a, a gallon of water that was sitting in direct sun all day. <laughs> I just I opened it. I just started guzzling it and it was hot water and it was, and it just made me gag. And I started vomiting from the hot water I just, and the heat exhaustion. I just started like dry heaving, like, like, you know what I mean? And then, um, at, by this point, um, we, everybody in the band was just full of heat exhaustion. It was really weird. It was a weird thing. The music, the gear is still like ringing in the field. People are like, standing there like what is going on the these paramedic people and their little golf cart come pulling up and they make jim get on the get on the golf cart and he runs away he because he woke up by then he bails and he hides he i remember he ran under a uh like another trailer he hit like a camper or whatever he hid underneath it <laughs> to get away from them <laughs> and me and rick just succumbed to it we're like let's just go with these people they're going to help us and we got on <laughs> we got on this we got on this uh golf cart and drove away and i remember the, the music the gear was still feedbacking and everyone was like cheering and i remember um someone was like metal like, <laughs> 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 like so dumb and we're like waving like hey, yeah yeah thank you thank you and like totally just sick from the heat and we they took us in this ice cold air conditioned um wonderful trailer it was like their hospital trailer or whatever yeah and um me and rick were laying there on cots and they were feeding us saltines and ice cold water and we were looking at each other and from across like we were on both you know he was on one side i was on the other we're looking at each other and we're just like giddy school boys we're kind of like laughing under our breath like <laughs> you know like can you believe we're doing this and uh we're like so we get it eventually they let us rest and then we get out there and um and uh, we go get our gear that had been packed up by another band, thankfully. And we thought, well, we just blew that, you know, like right. <laughs> the labels just watched us pass out in the middle of our show. But it's over. And dude, that's take hole was loved it. They thought it was amazing. Yeah. And they, they signed us from, from that stupid show. And that same night, cause I, we had suffered the heat exhaustion that day. And then we spent the rest of the day hanging out in Arby's cause it was air conditioned. And, um, I played a two hour set with blaster on drums that night. Oh my goodness. So I'm by the time that show ended, I remember, I literally remember like standing up, I threw the sticks down and I ran off stage. I, cause my tent was like several hundred feet away from the underground stage. And I just jumped in my tent and passed out. And that's the end of that day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but those were the days, man. That was, that was, that was the, the glory days of tantrum, you know. The stuff you can't imagine doing now, yeah. Oh God, no, no way. I'm laying here right now with a, a herniated disc in my back. So I mean, you know, I'm paying the price. <laughs> well, so like tantrum, you know, was your was your bread and butter, you know, for a while. I mean, and, it was my life. It, yeah, it made no money, but it was my life. I, I hear you. I, I do podcasts. I get it. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. like one of the things that I thought was so interesting is you guys had kind of the, the groundwork or the potential to be like one of those bands, like, like one of the bands in the, in the scene at that time that was really going to like take it all by storm, you know? So, you know, so what happened? We could have done a lot of bigger things. And I think what held us back was our attitude and our just feeding into that reputation and just, taking it one step above every time. Um, we, we started, unfortunately, we started to really um, feed into, 
Like it was like, we have to have an answer for everything. So if someone says to us in an interview, so what's your, what are your thoughts on this other band or this kind of music scene? Or what, what do, what's your thoughts on, on what's happening with the music nowadays or whatever? We always felt like we had to answer that question with a negative answer. And I don't know why we couldn't just be nice about it and say, oh, well, they're doing their thing and we're doing our thing and they're very different things or blah, blah, blah. We would have to be critical or have to be mean to the point where, you know, we, we put a song out, screw the Christian industry. I mean, yeah. the, an immature, an immature attack at best, I guess, but um, just wanting to just disassociate ourselves so much. And then, you know, it got to the point where, bands that we needed the support from were kind of like, I don't want to be around that band. You know, like, like I remember living sacrifice famously did an HM cover uh, interview and they were talking about a band in there um, that they were saying, you know, bands are going around like, you know, like this one band that goes around singing about how much they hate the industry that they're in and da 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 kind of like, very specifically pointed to us and uh jim had gone up to um bruce from living sacrifice and said yo you talking about us and he's like yeah i am actually i am and he just was like he just didn't like us he didn't like what we were about um which was a real bummer because we loved i was gonna say how did that make you feel as a living sacrifice fan from the beginning uh going back to the beginning i was a very emotionally uh um vulnerable person, very sensitive. And I had anxiety. So, um, while I'm playing that part of being like, you know, in this badass untouchable band that everyone knows is badass and you can't, I mean, that was like the, the stink in the air at the time, you know, I, right. I don't, I'm not saying we really truly were that way, but, but we, we were never negatively critiqued for what we did. We could. We were like a. We were a. We were a. Uh, a critic-proof band because we were raw enough that we could make mistakes and not get criticized for it. Like if you would go see, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a band that would be like real polished and particular with their instruments and stuff and um, real clean and all. And, and like the 77s, for example, like a, a band like that. It's like that caliber of rock right. and roll. They're just like amazing. They can do anything. If you go see them and they make a bunch of mistakes, you'd be like, man, they suck tonight. But when we would make mistakes, it wasn't like, man, they suck tonight. It was just like, my God, they were so f- off the wall crazy tonight. They didn't even give a shit. You know, yeah. that was the, so we were, we were critic proof because we, where we lacked in like um, a flawless, perfect set without mistakes, we delivered in just complete chaos and complete energy and just something always off the walls going on. Um, to when people left the show, they were just like, holy crap, that was so great. You know? And yeah. So we were just always in that m- mental state of how great we were. I remember conversations with people who were in bigger bands than us. I remember a specific person came to me one time and said, you guys are revolutionary. And I just <laughs> laughed because I was like, my God, what is, go- what, what does that even mean? Like, but, but it, I don't say that to, to be like, I'm cool. I'm saying that to, to point out that like this, we were just powerful. We felt powerful. We weren't powerful financially and we weren't powerful. Um, we weren't selling like, we weren't like going to blow up and become the next big thing, but we were powerful in the sense that all of the bands that were going to be bigger and were selling a lot more than us felt intimidated and threatened by us. I mean, to the point where they would go into interviews and say things in interviews that they just they just didn't like this this thorn in their side, you know. And going back to your question about Living Sacrifice, it bummed me out because specifically Living Sacrifice, I loved them and uh, had a lot of respect for them. And the part of me that was still that Christian fan, or that not even a Christian man, just a fan of them and a fan of music of that time before I was on stage with those bands, I felt it it bummed me out. I took took it personally because I was just sad because I was like, I want them to like us. I want, I want to be accepted, but I want to be accepted in the way that we are and more mature people who maybe understand business better and understand, you know, Christian behavior better (laughs) wouldn't, grant us that so we 
you know, we were hurting ourselves in the process. It was a weird thing because it's like we felt so powerful in some ways, but then, but yet we just, we were alienating ourselves from people when we, when it came time that we needed help from people, they weren't ready to give it back. Um, and, and then when it got to the label, it was like that. Then it's when it was really trouble because, um, we started to really feel like we were owed something from, from take hold and, um, had a real bad attitude with take hold. And looking back, I think that label did more than their share for us. Um, but we made it really hard for them, man. There was times where take hold would Chad would say, look, man, like you're the only band I put out this summer that I cannot put in Christian bookstores. They will not sell it. Right. Nobody's going to really, nobody's going to buy an album that has a song on it called screw the Christian music industry in a, in a Christian bookstore. Yeah. Which to us was great, but, but we're hurting the label. See, we're, we're making these decisions out of artistic integrity. And the meanwhile, the record label suffered for it. Right. And they're the ones paying the bill. And, right. and, and I remember having a meeting while we were in the studio and he asked us to not do certain things on the album and not to do that, not to do this. And we did it anyway. Cause we're just like, we're doing our record the way we want to do it. Well, and then he put it out gracefully. He put it out and, but then it, it, he, he started feeling like we didn't care about what they were doing for us, which is fair, very fair. Right. And meet me. It was, it was that met with the, also the issue of we have a person in the band who's a much older person than us, who is behind our backs talking to another person who's older. In other words, Jim was very good at talking business with other people who would do business Rick and I were like the two young kids. Rick and I were the artistic weirdos of tantrum. Right. Jim, Jim was the old school metalhead who had an education, had a college degree and was very, uh, very good at talking, like making you believe whatever he was sure. a good salesman. So he got, I think what happened was he got the record label to sort of take his side against Rick and I, and so Chad lost trust in Rick and myself because he started to believe that Jim was the powerhouse of Tantrum. Right. And he was saying one thing and it didn't match up to what you were saying. Yeah. Like Jim, Jim was basically setting up. There was a lot of animosity between the band at this point. And so uh, Jim, Jim uh, was telling a lot of people who we needed them to know the truth, things that were not true. He needed like so he so he was telling the label that he was writing the songs and he was teaching me how to sing and he was he was the one that taught me how to do the screaming and singing back and forth and all that like all of this bullshit just like total lies, um, and because because Jim and I are good friends to this day and and so I'm not saying this to bash him I'm saying this that at the time there was a bit of a power play between the guys in the band there was a lot of competition between each of us. I think a lot of it for Jim was that he was a great bass player, but he was not like nobody was bringing a full tantrum song to the table, but me like Rick would write his drum parts. Jim would write his bass parts, but nobody brought a full tantrum song written, but me. So there was, there was a, an issue there with Jim and I where there was tension and um, Jim had the upper hand as a salesman and as a, as a person with age credibility and was able to, um, convince people of things that weren't really happening. And, and so I, you know, I, I'm not saying that to bash Jim because this is the past and we've all been through this. No, I get it. Like he was, he was the, he was the face. He started to, on the business side, seeds that were really sabotaging the band. And, um, I mean, we were famously on that tour. Anyone who was at the shows, anybody who, was touring with us and we'll, we'll, we'll vouch for this, that, that, that we were at the point where we were fist fights. So there was just, just massive fighting and none of us were talking. Um, we were showing up to shows and we were playing like four, to- four songs. So we just didn't want to be there. And just, it just, we were, we were also feeling like we were being mistreated. Jim wanted to be taken more seriously. He thought that we, Rick and I were doing things to make us be not taken seriously. Um, there was almost like the parent to the kid vibe a little bit happening. And then, um, you know, we were feeling, all of us were feeling 
Like we were a part of a package tour from a, from a record label that had equally put out new albums from all four bands. So you had few left standing did Wormwood. You had um, uh, us doing modern music. You had narcissists doing new wave techno homicide and you had under Earth doing cries of the past. And they all came out at the same time. Yeah. So we were all there promoting our albums together as a team. And that is how that tour was booked. The kids were really turning out for under oath. The kids were turning out for, you know, mostly under oath. Um, the rest of us kind of felt like we were all on the same level. I think feel us standing had a little bit of, um, of an extra fan base going on a little bit, but tantrum clearly was the one weird, like thorn in the side of all the others. Um, so there was always this reputation of, well, tantrum's the opening band. And I remember we played for, um, um, Oh God. Uh, when I forgot their name, the bakers, Tommy, uh, Tammy Faye Baker and, and, Jimmy, Jim Baker, you know, their son, Jay Baker, he had a venue in, um, I want to say Atlanta or somewhere. I, where were they? Where was that from? Somewhere in the South. Anyway, um, he, he had a venue and we played and, uh, we got there and we found out that, um, we were the opening band and then there were some local bands and then the rest of the tour. And we were pissed like beyond words. Cause we were like, not only are you just throwing us in the beginning of your show, but then you're bringing local bands in that aren't even on the tour package. So that would be like you going to see, this is not like to compare us to the big four, but let's just say you're going to see the big four. All right. And, and, the and anthrax opens and then some local bands play and then the rest of the tour or <laughs> Megadeth or whatever, the two that seem to be the least popular. You know what I mean? You're not, you're booked, you're booked as a tour, and you're getting separated. So that was a bad deal for us. And we were, we were extremely angry. And we, we told Jay Baker, we weren't going to play his venue. And, wow. we, and then they talked, he said, he got all upset and was like, well, if you're not going to play, then we'll try and get you paid anyway, since you showed up. And then immediately the naive, the, the, the immediately the, the, the emotionally vulnerable you know, sensitive part of me comes out and I'm going, no, no, we'll play. We'll play. So we got up there, we played like 15 minutes and you know, that's how the tour started to become. It just became a, just a disaster. 40 days of disaster. (laughs) Oh man. Well, something I wanted to to throw in there was, uh, so at some point in the future, you know, obviously tooth and nail kind of bought take hold records. Yeah. Were were you guys any any part of that or was that ever mm-hmm. like a discussion on if Tooth and Nail would ever be like distributing your stuff or you know did they pick what bands they were going to keep cuz I know like Under Oath was uh at that time they were acquired you know from Take Hold and I, I was always wondering I was like well where does Tantrum fit into that? Yeah, we were all offered to sign over um of course, with us, there was always the, well, hey, hold on a second. Let's make sure we get this correct. You know? Right. At the time, it wasn't pursued as heavily the second time by either side. And the reason for that is because by the time that happened, which is 2002, I was living in Florida with Jim, who had now gone through a nasty divorce and was living in Florida with a psychotic woman. Uh And was just in a horrible place. Um, And I, Rick had left the band and he had now been the full-time drummer for the Huntington's. So at this point it was just you and Jim. Yeah, this is 2002. So like all that stuff I was talking about before I was 2000. Okay. And then 2001, there was a whole lot of uh, playing shows and doing some trips or short week, like weekend warrior type tours. Um, We had, we had not gone into a national tour anymore at that point and then um so we kind of just stayed busy and stuff we tried to i think i was starting to write write some new songs and all that and then um 2002 uh oh we played 2001 at cornerstone that was a great show um we brought the uh, pink nun out on stage that was controversial everybody hated us for that (laughs) um and then um, i wonder why well because um remember porn for youth yeah they were gonna do a uh a, a speech after our show. And they thought that we in bad taste brought the pink nun out who did her, her poems about STDs. 
um, they thought that that was like mocking porn for youth. Ugh. It didn't help that we were taking their stickers and we were cutting them so that they would say free youth porn. Yeah. And we were sticking them all over the place. We were just, we were, I'm so saying, you, like I'm you saying, were, we were just jerks. You we were, were being dicks. Yeah. Jerks. Sure, yeah. I get it. And that's the stuff I wouldn't, you know, say, Oh yeah, that was just okay. That was, you know, but so we played cornerstone in 2001. That was like, it went over really well because it was a high energy sort of a, um, great fun show. And then, um, but it, you know, Jim was in Florida by this point and we kind of met up there and just, just winged it basically. And yeah. And, uh, we weren't really a team anymore. And then like throughout 2001 and 2002, we just sort of disintegrated. Rick had gotten an invitation by the Huntington's and he became, a, he was like doing like Europe tours. And so I got this big stuff with them. He did a record with them. And, um, I went into a massive depression because I was so bummed about the band situation. I knew, I knew I would never be able to replace Rick. Just true. I never, ever was able to. Sure. Um, and then, um, I went to Florida in hopes to rekindle the band with Jim and find somebody in Florida. I thought, well, let's get out of Lancaster. Let's get out of this kind of like no man's land of musicians and go to a place that's got a much more vibrant musical scene. And, uh, so we did that and that failed miserably. Um, and I remember sitting at Jim's house and getting a phone call from Chad who had said, guys, I don't know. I just want to tell you, um, um, I'm selling out the label to tooth and nail. They're going to buy me out of my debt. And yeah. Cause he was massively in debt at the time. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And he said, um, what is your plan? What's the deal? Um, w- w- we're going to try and carry over, take hold into tooth and nail. Uh, you know, there's stuff we need to talk about that, blah, blah, blah. And I just flat out said to him, dude, we don't even have a drummer right now. So do what you have to do. And yeah. he let us, he let us out of our contract one record early and the rest was history. And then under oath became rock stars. They, they absolutely did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's always interesting because I always wondered how that worked because I always felt like had Tantrum been a tooth and nail band, this might be a different conversation. Like I may have had to go through a publicist to talk to you, you know, and um, well, you would have had a, to go through a publicist to play the music. Right. Talking for to sure. It would have been fine. But I but we wouldn't own the rights. And that's one reason why I'm happy we didn't sign, because I'm glad we have, uh, you know, I own the rights to the music and I can do whatever I want with it. You know, and I wouldn't be able to do that. You know, bands like me without you and, you know, Norma Jean or whoever else is, whatever's on that label now, Zayo, of course. Um, yeah. They have to pay all kinds of crazy fees to get their music to do anything. I know. I just recently commented on a post. Somebody was playing the uh, Splinter Shards uh, vinyl, and I was like, man, I really wish they had that vinyl. And then uh, Jeff from Zayo was like, well, We'll try. We'll try to get it to make to where it's easier for you guys to get, you know. And yeah. uh, it's it's just rough, you know. But yeah, the reason the reason for that is all licensing and publishing issues. Because, I mean, Tooth and Nail Records. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know. Uh, there's reasons, and I don't know what they are because I literally just don't know. But they are sitting on a gold mine. If they would just take everything from their catalog and do small runs of vinyl. Totally. We saw this with the Starflyer Gold reissue. As much of a disaster as it oh turned out. Oh my goodness! With, yeah, with the uh, with the manufacturing stuff. But but I mean, they posted that on a Friday at two o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and um, by the following, oh, within two hours, the gold there was five hundred gold, five hundred black. Uh, the 500 golds were sold out in two hours. It was gone, yeah. And the other 500 black was sold by the next day sometime. So yeah. we're looking at a day. We're looking at, at a, at a uh, we're looking at a world where, I, mean, I remember back then it was the album comes out, cassette, CD, maybe vinyl, and someone will buy one of those three if they buy it. And it was either a good sale or it wasn't. Bands like MXPX would sell lots of CDs, but no fans were buying six CDs. They were buying one CD, one yeah. cassette, yeah. one LP. Now they're buying 12 copies. All of them. Like whatever, like if there's five different it's colors. Small, it's bizarre. Could, yeah. you, could you imagine if we go back in time to 
10 years ago or so when physical media looked like it was going completely gone forever and it was all about the digital. Could you imagine how funny it would have came off if somebody would say, we are going to face a day where not only are physical copies of records, not CDs, but records going to sell more than CDs and, and cassettes and digital downloads. But on top of it, kids won't just buy one. They're going to buy them all. Right. And they're going to fight over them. And they're going to spend hundreds of dollars on one album. Even if 70% of them are scratched all to shit. <laughs> or unglued. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, <clears throat> we're living in this weird renaissance of physical media. And uh, it, it's, it astounds me. It's just, and I think to myself, this is a perfect time to not be on Tooth & Nail Records <laughs> you know, with, with my catalog. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> you know, I could probably do something with this. And I, I'm working on it. So, so when, when tantrum officially ended, you know, what was, what was the mindset behind that? Like, when did you realize that like, this has just got to stop? So yeah, to, when I was sitting in Florida <clears throat> in 2002 telling take hold goodbye. Um, I was also recording a solo album called, um, sympathy for the living, which I should tell you right there where my brain was. Um, so, you know, can I get a copy of that? <clears throat> Yeah, I gotta find more CDs. I, I, Jim claims he has a few boxes of them still. I don't have any, so I'm gonna try to get him to send them to me. If I get them, I will certainly. I'll bother him too. <clears throat> it's one of two solo albums I've done, and um, it's a complete improv album. I was just making these crazy tracks on the fly with very limited. I didn't even have instruments really. I had a I had a guitar with me. Well, actually, I had a bass too, but I didn't have any drums. I didn't have anything else, and I just made this weird thing. And I was just pouring my brain into that because I had nothing better to do. And I got into a really bad place down there, and I hated being in Florida. So I borrowed some money from a friend, and I drove home, and I decided to just go back, live with mom and dad for a little bit, <clears throat> and um, just kind of hang out. And uh, I went back to work. I started painting full time. I was painting off in the summers and stuff in between tours and all, but now I just became a full time painter and, um, I was single. I had gone through, had some girlfriends, but, um, you know, I just was in this weird spot of like, I got nothing going on and it was in a dark place spiritually. And I just was hitting rock bottom. Just feel like, just like awful. I was so depressed because the music didn't work out. I poured my heart and soul into the tantrum thing from 98 through 2004 um we had played a reunion we got we had got i'd come home from florida in 2002 and i reassembled the band actually briefly with a different bass player a guy named uh uh oh my god i can't remember his name now tyler oh my god sorry tyler dude was amazing too guy was playing like upright bass with an electric bass it was just amazing anyway <clears throat> tyler um and then uh, who else was in the band? Oh, I had gotten my buddy Seth to play keyboards. At this time, I was experimenting with keyboard type stuff and making weirder music. You, you King Crimson listening fucker. Yeah, yeah. we got into some prog rock. I kept getting told throughout the entirety of the tantrum days, I got, I was, I kept getting told that we sound like Rush. And <laughs> and I, I, for the record, I don't think we lighted even the remote candle to Rush. Hold not candle in, not in tantrum. I'm, I'm just going to say it, but yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, we. I would never ever compare myself to Rush. But what I understood was, they were saying that we were a power trio with higher vocals and smart-ish kind of music. So I, in that re- realm, that was what reminded them of Rush. It was like a band like Rush, you know. Which what they were trying to say was, you kind of remind me of something more progressive than like Helmet, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. After hearing about that a lot, I, I finally was like, well, let me hear what Rush is about. I didn't start listening to Rush until um, like 2001, somewhere in that range, 2002. And then I got obsessed with them. I just love them. I bought everything they did and went to see them. And, uh, and so, yeah, I started playing, putting together a, a new band with Tantrum that was more progressive. And then um, by, by this point, Jim was living on a boat with his now third girl 
wife, whatever, <clears throat> down in Florida. He's a and good he looking got, guy. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he he got kicked off this boat because there were these storms coming, and he was evicted off this boat, and he had nowhere to go. <laughs> and um, I just got kicked off a boat, dude. Yeah, straight up. He's like, dude, I'm I'm not allowed to live on this boat. I'm homeless now. <laughs> oh man, uh, me and me and the wife would like to uh, maybe come come north and find a spot there. I said, dude, it's not funny, to- but it's funny. <clears throat> no, it's really funny. I said, come to Lancaster and do tantrum with me. And uh, we were paying Tyler because he was driving so far. And I said, you know what, man, Jim's going to be in Lancaster. And I think we're just going to use Jim because I don't want to keep paying you, even though it was fair for you. I don't, I. You know, it makes sense to just get Jim back. So Jim came back. Rick had gotten off of the, the Huntington thing for a bit, and he was interested in playing again. So we came back, and basically, after doing a couple shows without the, that lineup, we eventually got the lineup back. And then with the addition of Seth on keyboards. And this was as Tantrum, right? Yeah, this would be like Rick, Jim. Okay. Himself. And then we had my buddy Seth, and then who was just kind of adding more stuff to the songs. And uh, we played like two shows, and then Rick was done again. He just didn't want to do it. Rick felt like it ran its course and wasn't the same. He felt like the spiritual energy in the band wasn't right. Rick was always Rick was always the first one to be true to just staying in the Christian. Um, like he, you know, he, he was the first one who felt like we were going too far in the, the wrong direction. He had his areas, don't get me wrong. But in that time, he felt like this isn't the same. This is still that dark cloud. And he didn't want to be a part of it anymore. And when that happened, I had tried out, um, I had tried out some drummers and it just wasn't working out. So when Rick announced that was the end of it for him, we played a show and that was the last show we ended up ever playing. We didn't know at the time. We knew it was his last show, but we played our last show in 2004. And then um, uh, I had searched for some drummers unsuccessfully. And then I said, you know what? I think I'm holding my life back by constantly trying to keep this thing going. Yeah. So I, I got a hold of HM Magazine and I said, I want to put it in writing. I want it to be official. So tell the world that Tantrum of the Muse is dead so I can officially say it's dead. And they printed that and it was like closure for me because it was like, it's not dead until you put it in writing. (laughs) You know what I mean? So I put it in writing and then um, right after that, I met my now wife. So I just poured my time and energy into this relationship that became amazing. And, you know, 2004 to 2006, I dated, got married in 2006 and uh, started on teachers. What was that? Well, let's get into that. A little bit, you know. Um, I know it's the middle of the night, but I don't give a shit. Um, So with Unteachers, you know, one of the things, so like you know, and anybody that's that's listened to Discography Discussion knows that we were pretty big fans of that record, Uh, A Human human Comedy. And um, I think it's a good record. I think it is too. As a matter of fact, I, I told Travis, your cousin, I texted him like last year and I said, Man, if I had a debut album that was that good, I would kick my grandmother in the face <laughs> just to have a debut album that was that good. And I would I would <laughs> tour 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 on that thing. Yeah. Until well, until know, I was blue in the face. <clears throat> well, a couple things. Um my grandmother did not get kicked in the face at all. She's she's dead now though. Not from being kicked in the face. She died in natural causes. Um, but the problem with that record, <laughs> I'll just launch into the problems. My, my grandmother's dead too, but I would still do it. You'd still kick her. I would. Boy, I would oh, dig boy, up. Oh, I would dig up the grave. Dig up. You would exhume the body and kick her in the face. For I, a record I, I would do it. I'm so <laughs> sorry, but I would do it. If if it well, meant if it meant having a song like Higher Horses on my debut album. Man, okay. So check this out. You guys grac- graciously did a wonderful um, bonus feature where you reviewed the album and talked about 
your love for it and everything. And I thank you for that. I appreciate it. But that album is such a weird thing in my life because we've, so I started a band in 2007, six or seven. And I had a nice whole lineup of people in Baltimore. And it was a great lineup. I had Tyler's brother, Tommy on drums. I had a guy named Brian on bass, Brian Denny. I had Seth from Tantrum on the keys. I had myself. Who else was in there? Uh, that was it. And, um, and we, we um, were really good. We, we were played really tightly. Um, and we recorded a demo that had, let's see, Higher Horses had Fear of Silence. It had, what else was on that? I don't remember what else was on there. There was another one on there. But anyway, um, and then we did another demo. We broke that band up before we even did anything with it. That It all disintegrated because the, the people in the room were just, it was a weird personal chemistry, but even though the music was good. What was it called? Um, I mean, it was on Teachers, but it was it was just the the chemistry was weird with the group, and I I I had moved on, and then I briefly I got Rick in the band around 2009, and we did um, a cover of Vengeance Rising called Fill This Place with Blood, and we did um, Swim with a Knife as a demo, and then Rick got into some. Uh, Bible college stuff and was really busy and couldn't do it. So now I'm back <laughs> to square one, just myself. Right, right. In 2010, Travis, my cousin Travis, and I started talking about it. He joined and he got his buddy Josh to join. We only had like maybe three songs written or four songs. I started writing a lot. <clears throat> I would write, we wrote, um, the plan was to release two EPs and the idea was that the first EP would be spiritually like a downward spiral. And okay. then the second half would be like this returning to faith kind of thing. Like that was like the spiritual idea, kind of like the pink Floyd, the wall, but backwards. Sure. And, um, <clears throat> so we got the attention of Veritas vinyl somewhere in there and they said they would love to put out the album. And so then we were like, Oh, album. Okay. So we rewrote we, we had already demoed, tracked a bunch for that first half. Um, we did the drums. We were working on finishing that with a buddy named Brad, who has this great house studio um, in uh, Easton, PA, near near the Pocono Mountains. Um, we were, were tracking the first half. And when Veritas came into the picture and offered to do an album, then we decided to stop doing what we were doing and scrap it and finish the second half and then make it an album. And in that process, it took forever to do. It was just a constant. We lost drum tracks. We had to re-record things, equipment failures. Um, we were all driving two hours apart from each other. Um, we were doing this in between job stuff, of uh, kids stuff. I wasn't a father yet, but the other two were, Josh and Travis. Um, it was just like this insane experience of trying to get this thing done. And I say all this because what I don't like about the album is it's not a live band album. It's a, it's a, an album of songs that were written by me. The band played their part of it. And, but it's not like, like if we were to play it live, it wouldn't be exactly like you hear it because it, right. We layered, um, other instrumentation and, just, you know, we, we, we were focused on making this album sound the way it needed to be. And we didn't focus on like playing it as a three piece, which is not possible. Um, not unless you're rush, which we've already <laughs> established. We're not. So, <laughs> so, I mean, so the album was a, was a major flaw for me on some issues. The bass presence is like MIA on it. There's no, you don't hear bass tone from the bass guitar and it, it was just not recorded with the, the gear that it was supposed to be recorded in. Um, I feel like Higher Horses could have been a much better song than it is on that album. I know you love it. I don't know, great, man. I really enjoyed that one. you should have heard the demos. It's just, 
it was it was better because the bass guitar actually leads the song. I got a new really address, f- man. You can send me the demos. I'll 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 dig it up. But but yeah, so it's just and then, you know, out of all the time we spent on it, which I think was like literally four years, we spent off and on piecing that thing together, the everything from the packaging and the artwork. And and I had given Trav I was such a control not a control freak, but I had written all the songs and I had so much control over it that I purposely kept myself out of the artwork as much as possible. And I said, Travis and and Josh, you guys come up with a concept. The concept should the, should be that you're looking um, like one side of the cover is you're looking into one direction. And if you turn it, you're looking from the other direction. And, and what you should be seeing is one side is coming from a place of death. Another place is coming from a place of life. So the front cover should be you coming away from death, moving into passing into a new place of spiritual peace. And the way that was presented was with the um, comedy tragedy um, curtain call, you know, the curtains are open and, there's two people. One has a slight smile. One has a slight frown. And it's supposed to be like the comedy tragedy thing. And then past those two people who are opening the curtains, you're leaving death. You're hen- entering into a, a spiritual change. And that's what the cover is. That's why you see the cusp of the moon. That's why you see the tulips, which was my personal um, contribution. Because I wanted it to insinuate my spiritual beliefs of Calvinism. Um, and you know, there's all these different things like the, the fish with the loaves and all or the, with the water, like all that stuff was supposed to be different, like symbols of spiritual positivity that Josh and Travis came up with. And I, to this day could never explain it the way they did. Um, when you flip the record around, you see cancer cells, you see rotting meat decomposition. And that was like what we thought could symbolize spiritual death. So that's what that is. Um, we worked really hard on it for four years and it came out and no one gave a shit. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and we did, but maybe nobody, it was a little too late. Yeah, nobody. I, I don't think anybody even knows about it. Honestly, it's like this album that really, and I don't say this about my band stuff. Normally I'm not like we deserve this or we deserve that this album is good enough that it should have gotten a lot more attention than it did. What was there ever a temptation though to name it Tantrum of the Muse just to kind of dial into that pre existing fan base that was there? Um, well, I'll say it like this a lot of the songs on it, not a lot of it, like part the first couple that we wrote were intended to be tantrum songs. It would have been the stuff that carried over from when I was writing the third tantrum album. Right. Um, and it was also because remember now, I had fought off a lot of rumors about who was writing what and who was doing what with the band with tantrum that I really wanted to establish very clearly that when you hear this, you know who wrote those other songs. Right. And so there was part, some of the tantrum baggage definitely came into the first on teachers, which is why I'm so excited about the new album because the new one's not like that. But, um, the, there was definitely some carryover of, um, the musical stylings and the musical concepts. And I mean, and, and ultimately I, I write songs now the same way I wrote them when I was a high schooler, you know, it's like, I just want to hear whatever it is I want to hear. Sure. And I, and whatever's in my head, I'd play it. I don't, I never like changed styles. It's just that I grew up and my styles just changed on their own. But I, but so some of that transitioned in. So I wouldn't say I was tempted to call it tantrum of the muse. There's definitely times where I thought like, should I, Hmm. but I, at that point was very well, like I was happy closing that door and just saying like tantrum of the muse should always just be me, Rick and Jim. Sure. Um, unless, unless we want it, unless like two of us really want to do it and the other just gives our blessing and says, go ahead and do it. But it, you know, I mean, if, to be truly tantrum of the muse, all the work that was done that made any difference was the three of us. And so I'm okay with it just being that and on teachers being its own thing. And, uh, I think it's a lot more mature songwriting anyway. So 
Well, in between, you know, the the kind of rebirth of Unteachers and, you know, the previous album, you had gone off and done a second uh, and like uh, independent album. Yeah. So so on Teachers broke up again with the Travis lineup, Travis and, and Josh, and then a few more years went by. And then currently on Teachers is at its healthiest lineup, which is me, Rick from Tantrum, and our best friend, Keith Scotton on bass, um, who we're all in the same age bracket. We're all dads. We're all on the same spiritual page. We're like completely like doing it for healthy reasons. It's not full time. We do it like once a month. We're actually on a hiatus right now because of Rick's going. This it's always Rick, man. Rick's got stuff going on all the time, but um, he's he's in school now, finishing up a course that he has to get done, and it's taking too much of his time. So we're on a hiatus, but we started to write, re- rework the, the human comedy stuff live, and it sounds great. We've got the gear together and everything's sounding wonderful. And so if we can just get past this funk of, you know, young fatherhood and, you know, all the life themes that we're dealing with in school, careers, we will get out on stage and finally play the songs because that's a lot of the reason why nobody knows about us. Um, and while we were doing all this. I finally got off my chest a album that you were asking about called the spirit shrill. It's a follow up to him. Um, sympathy for the living. And it's a, it's a, an album that deals with my disdain for the charismatic movement to put it lightly. Okay. And it's uh, it's dealing with a lot of the stuff that I grew up with, the, the satanic panic, going full circle here with, you know, you know what I said in the beginning, um, and just sort of like, you know, spiritual abuse and mental abuse and mental sickness, and just kind of like when you spiritualize mental sickness and what it, the kind of creepy things that come out of that, and um, so I made this um, this music. That is very, um, it's supposed to be very much like a, like a soundtrack, like a soundscape sounds soundtrack to a hellish place. It's a very oppressive and angry and dark album. Probably the darkest thing I've ever made actually. I mean, what do you think? I mean, you've heard it. (laughs) Um, you tell me what it sounds like. (laughs) Well, and, and to be totally honest, I think that it is, um, very much a um it is a noise like it, it's hard for me to compare it to anything because like the the more noise focused bands that I listened to when I was younger um stuff like and I'm, the name of the band escapes me right now I probably too many beers in but uh <laughs> mental destruction oh yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah they're an influence for yeah, sure yeah so I have I have one of their albums yeah. called Straw Oh yeah, I love and, straw. And that's what it reminded me of a little bit in that it's it's not like if you want to hear ten tracks of, of punk rock or ten tracks of hardcore or ten tracks of, of, of screamo or whatever you want to call it, that's not what this is. <laughs> this is this is a more atmospheric kind of bearing of the soul type of album. I describe it as a um a fever dream because there are the way it's edited. It it quite literally will like float in and out of a weird, um, like it, like it will like flutter away something, but come into some other thing. And it reminds me of how dreams play out sometimes where you're, where like just that it's, it's there, but it's may not be real. And I don't even know how to describe what I'm saying, but like when you hear it, you'll feel it kind of like fading, like musical pieces will fade up and other things will fade down. And then it'll kind of like in another spot, will go back in another direction. And it just feels like you're like, you're standing on a, on a boat of like, it's just like the floor is just rocking back and forth on you. Like it doesn't, it, I don't know how else to describe it than that to the way I, and I say that I, I made it. So it, 
it sounds like I'm scripting that, but what I'm saying, I'm not scripting it. It's the only album in my entire ever making albums where I actually got to feel what it was like to not write the album, but to hear it. Right. If that makes any sense, because the way it came together wasn't pieced together in a structure like an album is made. So, right. It's one track. It's it's one go. I was able to take things and bring them together in a track or in a project and, and, um, just sit there and do some things with, um, with, with the fades and the, and some of the effects and create something and then sit back and hear it for the first time and be like, Whoa, it's like, it's, it's presenting itself to me right now. Cause I didn't know what that was going to sound like. And then get that experience of like, where I could, was able to turn it off and actually go, wow, that was really cool where you don't really get that experience normally. Cause it's, you know, you, you lay the tracks, the drums, you lay the guitars, you lay, you hear it being built. And by the time it's done, you're like, wow, it sounds really cool, but it's not the same as like, you're hearing it like an audience. And that's a weird state that I was able to, to tap into with this album. Probably the proudest part of it for me was that I was able to create an album 100% on my own and still experience it like a fan or like a listener. So yeah, it's, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. And I've, I've, you know, I've been kind of a dick about like not putting a review of it up because I actually, I actually did really enjoy what I heard and I've had a lot of trouble putting that into words. (laughs) <laughs> take I, your time. I, I have it's <laughs> the rest not, of the world has to take your time <laughs> well no it, but like it's not it's not one of those things where i'm trying to like be like oh it's bad i don't want to say anything it's not one of those it's it's more of just this is a totally different thing than i necessarily am qualified to review you know, because to to review something, you don't need that, to be qualified to review. Yeah, but but you can to tell re- me if it's but, shit, if you but think it's to shit. be, but no, because I don't think it's shit. If it, if I thought no, it I was, know, but I'm saying you could say whatever. Yeah, you want I mean, if I if I thought it sucked, I would tell you. You know, like it's right. not one of those, but it is a unique experience that I think that you need to hear for yourself. It's available now. Yeah, absolutely, you can you can pick it up. It's called the Spirit Trill. Torstrapmedia.bandcamp.com. There it you is. Can, you can get your copy. There I it is. I will send it to you personally. And I also feel the need to uh, to to do the Tantrum uh, Bandcamp page. Yeah, Tantrum of the Muse at Bandcamp.com and Unteachers at Bandcamp.com are all. I'm on all 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 the projects are out there for your listening enjoyment. And I will say, um, I'm in talks right now with a lab, a, a pretty decent record label. Um, um, we're going to try and do a Kickstarter or some sort of an Indiegogo campaign to press the Heart as a Two-Headed Sperm to vinyl. And I think the time is now because maybe I'll get five people to buy it and they'll buy you know, 20 copies of it because that's what people do now. Well, I'll buy one copy of it if that you know, sweetens the Thank deal you. for anybody. Yeah. Well, any, any copies sold would be great. But the plan there is to um, – get the the album pressed obviously and then um i'm gonna it's gonna be remastered <clears throat> it won't be remixed because we can't possibly do that but it will be remastered it's a, it sounds way better um it doesn't change the sound of the album it just changes it's just cleaner like the samples have been have been cl- replaced with with digital so you don't get a lot of the hiss and noises it just sounds it just and like and the tracks flow like there's a lot a lot of the audio glitches of, of that recording are just like gone, but not in a way where it takes away. Sure. Like at all of what you are used to hearing. So, um, it just sounds bigger and better and you're going to get, um, bonus tracks with the digital. And, um, I'm going to actually, uh, put together what will be like a podcast format, but it's going to be a download of a commentary of every track of the album Plus there's going to be some stuff like interviews with the band members. There's going to be interviews with the guy who recorded it, Jeff Stoltzfus. Um, and people who were involved, we're just going to get them all together for a big reunion party. And we're going to do a big audio presentation that will be included. Um, it's going to, I'm going to begrudgingly get uh, Rick on board to talk about stuff and we get Jim in there. Um, 
yeah, I'm going to get Jason, the original bass player, to come in here. We'll talk about the history, uh, the, the, pre, the pre-recording days, um, and just the ruckus days and all the stuff that came before it. You're going to hear... Um, you're going to hear stuff you never heard. You're going to hear some of the previous ruckus stuff that was done before, not the stuff you've heard, but the, uh, the, uh, the stuff we did right before the heart of the two headed sperm. Okay. It's going to be a lot of like cool stuff. And we're going to do some limited merchandise of the album. And we're going to do, um, we're going to try and get, um, some, some of the, uh, you know, the, the, what do you call them? The rewards or whatever. We're going to do some creative things where, you know, um, we might even try to do a new song or we might do a, um, we might redo a song, but change the lyrics to anything you want us to change them to. And, you know, just whatever. We're just going to let fans take control of us and play us like a book, you know, read, read us like a book for a, uh, you know, to get what they want. So, so that we can get the, what we want, which is the record. So, um, if all goes well, it'll happen. Worst case scenario, we'll just do CDs and it'll be boring. But I'm hoping for the uh, the vinyl. I think it'll be great. So look for that. I'll still buy a CD because my original CD is pretty scratched up. Well, and the and the initial idea is is to really get to the second album because that one was recorded on tape. So we can remix it and make it sound better and. You know, sound all modern. You're gonna add a whole bunch of like new metal bass drops to everything, right? Exactly. No, we, I, I, we always hated the mix, and I think, um, I think what we would do is probably offer, offer, um, to keep it for the purists, keep it the same, but, but probably like if we're gonna invest in a vinyl for that or something, or even CDs, like we should make an improvement that we know we can make. And so basically I'm going to George Lucas the hell out of it. And then I'm going to, um, uh, but I'll, ma- I'll make it available as an, as unlike George Lucas did, I'm going to make both versions available. So you can, you can be a purist and you can have the, the space scenes in star Wars with the strings attached and all that, or you can have it repaired and changed, which I think, within the modern music album sense, it's going to sound better. It'll be heavier. So that's the important thing. You want it to be heavier, always heavier so. all the time. That's, that's <clears throat> yeah. all I care about is how We're heavy an album get, is. It's just, it's too dry. There's too much mid and it's got too. um, it just doesn't have an, like the, you should have heard the demos were so heavy and I know it's in there somewhere. We just got to get it, pull it out a little bit. I'm just saying I'm right here, man. You could send those demos. Over well, the demos those want. demos are on a cassette tape. Somewhere. Well, you have to send to. me the cassette tape in the mail, like a, like an old person. You've got enough of my terrible old cassettes. I I do. I was going to bring that up, but I decided not to. Well, That's Stephen, very... thank you so much for taking the time out tonight to yeah, talk. Uh, thank being, you. Being laid fun. up, being laid up with a with a herniated disc and all that, and yeah, if that part sucks. But I I enjoy uh, reminiscing about the past. It's a it's an important part of my life, so I um enjoy telling the stories and stuff like that. So, well, I enjoy it too. Well, we're going to go ahead and end it here and, uh, we will, uh, you guys are going to hear Steven on another episode of discography discussion. It's going to happen. So, you know, just wait for that. Yeah. And hopefully the next one, I'll be talking about the new on teacher stuff. Cause it's getting real close. I mean, we, I demoed the whole album, so, um, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, you're going to hear new music this year. Even if I have to do it myself, you're going to hear it. It's going to be insane. We're all going to love it. It's going to be great. You're, you're going to love it. I can guarantee you that. That being said, thank you guys so much, and uh, we will talk to you guys next week. Take care. Thank you.